We've been thinking and talking about John Roden as an underrecognized but world traveled, like well decorated African American sculptor. Um, and getting to talk about his public works, I think, gets us in the frame of thinking about who Roden's many audiences might have been. Um, and so I'm going to go right to the um, slides so we can see. Ah, and we're good. Okay, um, so starting right in, a little bit of background for folks who maybe don't uh, know who Roden is. Um, so John Walter Roden was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1916. Um, and as a young man, he observed a sculptor in the area, a Scotsman named William Grant, making work in his studio um, when he was just a kid and was sort of passed by this window studio all the time. Um, and at one point was invited inside essentially by this, this artist sculptor who saw Roden at the window every day and said, okay, you clearly have an interest in this, you have a talent for this, um, why don't I invite you in and sort of see what you can do? Um, so he did, and he gave him a hunk of clay. Uh, a young John Roden took it home um, and sculpted a portrait bust of a family member, his sister, and brought it back. Um, and it was good enough that the established sculptor sort of took him in and started to mentor him, which is sort of a thread that runs through Roden's life and career, this, this sort of mentoring um, as a way that he gets into art making. Um, so he attended Parker High School in Birmingham and then Talladega College. Um, and at Talladega College, he was lucky enough to meet Hale Woodruff, who at the time, it was right before he had started uh, working on the Amistad murals for those who know um, sort of early 20th century African-American art, the Amistad murals um, are a really important suite of work that Hale Woodruff undertook um, at Talladega. But right before, while Roden was a college student, he was lucky enough to meet Woodruff there. And Hale Woodruff told him, you know, if you, if you want to be an artist who's, who's taken seriously, um, you really should come see me in Atlanta and you really should visit New York City. Um, and so Roden later spoke famously in this interview, you know, that he went to New York on vacation on Hale Woodruff's advice um, and just never, never ended up leaving New York as happens to a lot of artists in New York. So while he was in New York, um, he was lucky enough to meet Augusta Savage. And so this is 1936. This is right on the tail end of the Harlem Renaissance. And the sculptor Augusta Savage introduced him to Richmond Barté. And at the time, Richmond Barté was the most well-known African-American sculptor. He had an established audience. He had a collector base. Um, he was really prolific. He had trained at the Art Institute of Chicago, and he was regularly exhibiting work. Um, and so meeting Barté at that time was really, uh, was really important and crucial for him because that began like the core mentoring relationship of the time that ended up being the launch pad for Roden's career. So he moves into Barté's sort of studio and life and network um, and hooks up with a number of figures who are huge in the Harlem Renaissance era at this time. Um, and so we're talking about not just other visual artists, but performers like Cab Calloway, um, intellectuals and writers. Um, and so Roden is in the same mix with all of these artists in the, 19, in the late 1930s, the early 1940s. Um, and so in 19, in, in the early 1940s, though, he uh, has his arts career disrupted in a way um, by World War II. Um, but when he enlisted in the army, his arts practice continued. And so one of the things that he did while he was an enlisted soldier was uh, he arranged entertainment and art classes for other soldiers who were enlisted. Uh, he did murals uh, for the the, he was stationed in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so he did murals for uh, a number of places uh, where they were stationed. Uh, and he also sculpted portrait busts of a number of figures. And so 
He exchanged letters with Barté frequently while he was enlisted and with uh, Alain Locke, who was a mutual friend of his and Barté's and considered the dean of the Harlem Renaissance. He was on faculty at Howard at the time. Um, and in some of the letters, there's, some, there's a really charming way that Roden talks about all of the work he's making while he's in the army um, and thinking about what it might look like to exhibit all of these portrait busts in a show after his military service is done. And I think it's really important to think about what it is to be an artist and a soldier at this time, that the two don't actually get separated for Roden, that he really continues to sculpt the entire time that he's enlisted, um, which is really interesting. And so after the war, uh, Roden ends up attending Columbia University on the GI Bill. Um, and while he was at Columbia, he studied with Aranzio Maldarelli, Hugo Robus, and William Zorak. And these are direct carvers. They're, they're sculptors that are trained in the tradition of carving directly onto medium and form. And so what I hope you'll, you'll take from this image that you're looking at now um, is that Rodin, you know, this is Rodin in, uh, I believe, like 1949, maybe 1950, at Columbia University, and he's winning top sculpture prizes, which is why this, this publicity photo exists from the, from the archives, the John Roden papers at PAFA, and is published in newspapers all over the countries in the arts section. Um, and so you're looking at this, these animal figures, um, this bust, this beautiful stone carving of a, of a female torso, uh, figurative work, um, and this bust of a, of a head that is um, tulip wood, I believe. Um, and so part of what's interesting in this period is that Rodin is working in bronze, wood, and stone primarily in this, in this time period. And he would continue to work in those mediums uh, throughout his career. But this early moment of, of being trained and immediately starting to receive prizes um, is really interesting and really remarkable for this era. If you think about uh, 19, the late 1940s, the early 1950s, um, this is this is really like the, like the launch pad for, for Roden's career. Um, and so not only is he winning the top sculpture prizes at Columbia University, he also exhibits work in a sculpture, in a painting and sculpture show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1951, um, which is really remarkable if you think about how early in his artistic career that might have been, sort of fresh out of art school and the kind of launching pad that was for him. So at the same time, uh, he won a scholarship to the prestigious Skowhegan School for Painting and Sculpture. Uh, he met Roshenda Phillips, a painter from Washington State, who he eventually went on to marry. Um, and shortly after, in 1952, he became the first Black American visual artist to win a fellowship uh, to the prestigious American Academy in Rome. Um, and this image that you're looking at now is Rodin in studio at the American Academy in Rome. And part of what happens in the early 1950s for him is it's, it's Rodin going international for the first time. Um, it's also Rodin getting to work in large scale and the having access to the large studios in Italy was something that made it possible for Roden to work in large scale. Um, and one of the things I'm wanting to do is sort of lay out an arc of Roden's life and his training to, to understand how he comes to work in public sculpture, how he comes to work in large scale. Um, and this tack back and forth between, of course, you know, if you think about, you know, early career, being an art student, living in New York, um, the kind of space that you have to make work, even if you have really ambitious goals for the work, might limit what your output might, will look like in a way that now moving to Rome and having access to uh, large scale foundries, large scale studio works, you can actually start to see him carry that ambition out. And so he wins the Rome prize. Um, which is really amazing. He travels all over Europe um, and it really kicks off this beginning of world travel for him that runs through an arc of his career in the 1950s and 60s. So in 1955, uh, Roden became part of an artist delegation sponsored by the United States State Department where he visited 20 countries between 1955 and 1959. Um, and so what you're looking at is some of the, the press material that follows him all over the world. Um, and just as a sort of, as a sampling, um, 
Those countries included Ireland, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Italy, Germany, Egypt, Uganda, um, Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, Poland. Um, and at the time, he's traveling on a delegation that includes Franklin Watkins and Lamar Dodd. Um, this is the beginning of his really beginning to travel throughout the world, exhibit all over the world. It also means that he's lecturing throughout the world. He's meeting other artists. If you think about the social networks that are being built at this time, that he starts to uh, get international press for his work. And he's also really taking in and syncretizing, I think, all of these global traditions. Um, there's some really excellent travel photography in the John Roden papers in the archives at PAFA, um, where you can see that he's really looking at the architecture everywhere he goes. He's taking photos of museums and gallery shows everywhere that he's going, and he's really looking at what is the classical tradition that's on view in galleries and museums in Italy. Um, he's looking at architecture throughout South Asia and throughout North Africa. Um, there's a way that that starts to show up in the work that starts to show up in his the way he stylizes the figure he begins working in this very classical tradition that you imagine a mid-century new yorker being trained in an ivy league institution in the in the kind of you know the almost uh the, the academy training style um like that makes sense but he really kind of starts to abstract the figure becomes really interested in other um, in other world traditions, other world approaches to the figure um, and to religion, to spirituality, to iconography, to symbolism um, in this period in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. Um, and so this is, now you're looking at an image of Rodin teaching in South Korea. And so part of what I think is really interesting about understanding how Rodin makes work um, is that the, he moves through the world as an artist and as a teacher um, in an almost seamless way once he moved to New York, um, links up with networks associated with the Harlem Renaissance, and then moves throughout the world. You can see from his military service to his art school training to his travels that he is at his core an artist and a creator and an educator the entire time. So everywhere he goes, he's looking at other people's work, he's making work, he's in community with artists, he's lecturing for students. Um, he's, you know, there's a kind of like a really lovely relationship that he has building with this core of artists, this delegation that he's traveling the world with and the artists that he's meeting. There's, there's a real exchange uh, between him and and his other his fellow artists and art students um, and in this image he's holding up a picture of one of his sculptures that's called the dancer um, that is in the collection at PAFA um, and I'm hoping that you're able to see that you you know you have this figure in this in this pose this this female figure leaned back on on the hands um, and this is the beginning of moving away from the kind of classical reclining stone figures that he makes early in his career to these more stylized figures. And he's um, really inspired by the dance traditions he's seeing all over the world at this point. Um, and so in this period, he, after, after traveling the world, uh, sponsored by the U.S. State Department. He won a research fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation to, um, and I'm quoting here, reside in Java and Bali to study traditional and modern Indonesian sculpture. And this is in 1959. And Rodin ends up spending two years in Indonesia, um, and he's working in large-scale wood sculpture, which again is a feature of him having access to this large-scale work. So prior to working in Indonesia, um, the way he was able to make large, large bronzes in Italy uh, because he had access to a larger studio and there's these large scale foundries. I um, mean, he's in community with these artists who were working large in this medium. Indonesia really marks the period of him beginning to work large scale in wood. Um, and that's about having access to rosewood and tulip wood in Indonesia that he didn't have access to in other places. Um, and so you start to see these larger than life figures, um, these totemic figures that are really kind of a blend of um, sort of the, the public work that he's seeing because in Indonesia in 1959, when he got there, 
the government was actually um, in upheaval. And so it was a really challenging time to try to live and make work. There are a number of letters between him and the foundation about the fact that because the military has uh, taken over hotels, that he and Rashonda were not finding places that they could stay for longer than a few days at a time, that they couldn't get materials out of customs, um, and that he was finding ways to build with uh, farmers and agriculture workers in the area to use their tools to start to make work, um, which is sort of incredible if you think about, you know, the ways that artists manage to make work under even the most impossible circumstances, and that it's really impressive work. Um, and I'm wanting to show these images so you don't just see Rodin at work, that you get a sense of scale, um, that he is somebody who is making work in large scale, these 10 foot, 12 feet, uh, 15 feet sculptures sometimes, um, that is now you know the beginning of this really, really ambitious work. Um, and so after returning from Indonesia, uh, Rodin and Rashonda, uh, who got married while they were abroad, purchased a, a home in Brooklyn Heights that had formerly been uh, once a public car garage, um, at another point in its life cycle, firehouse storage, uh, storage for fire horses for the fire department in New York. Um, and it's this four story, 8,000 foot square home that they purchased and renovated themselves. And so in this 1966 article that you're looking at now about the Roden home, they talk about the fact that they're renovating it themselves. This kind of like making impulse of these two artists in this space carries into their home life in Brooklyn um, that they were laying floors themselves from reclaimed wood in the area. Um, and this home eventually became a walking tour spot, but the journalist in the article is pointing out in 1966 even that the sort of prime space of the home is the ground floor studio that Roden was using to make work in that was quote, currently filled with rigging for a 20 foot garden sculpture he is working on for the new Harlem hospital. Um, and so if you can see, this is, uh, I believe, the second or third floor of the Roden home, you can get a sense of one, you know, that large scale wood sculpture that Roden was in the picture with in Indonesia, here in the photo on the left. Um, if you think about the scale of that kind of work, to then have that work shipped back to their home in New York, this gives you a sense of the scale of the home and this kind of like rodent working large um, that this piece that had formerly been exhibited in these very public spaces in Indonesia now move into the rodent home. Um, and the home isn't just their domestic space, it's their working space. Both Roden and Rashonda were artists, and so Roden had a studio on the ground floor. Rashonda had a studio where she painted on one of the upper floors. They also used this, uh, their home space was on a walking tour of Brooklyn. So there's an audience for Roden's work that is, you know, not just elite spaces, but also neighbors. So he's still teaching, still making work. There are still people who are able to see this work in the Roden home, which is a really incredible way to see See work when artists are living with the work, um, a kind of view that you don't necessarily get in museums and in galleries. And at the same time, he was exhibiting in museums and galleries. Um, and so he showed in, in the galleries in New York, he showed in university galleries. Um, on the right, he, you'll see that he was a featured artist in um, uh, a piece that Ebony Magazine had done in 1963, where they chronicled um, just a whole generation of Black artists at the time that they thought were really important to their leaders, to, to their readership. Um, and I think that there's something about having these multiple audiences, this kind of, um, you know, these arts institution for Rodin to be showing in in proper institutional spaces like museums and galleries, but also to get coverage in the popular press and to be showing at universities um, and in HBCUs, which are really important to his career. If you think about him starting at Talladega College, um, him being in community with uh, Elaine Locke at Howard, um, that he's really moving throughout these many kinds of spaces and having various kinds of audiences. And he's also in a number of important shows for the history of Black exhibitions in the 20th century. And so he has work in the Contemporary Black Artists in America show at the Whitney Museum in 1971. Um, and he showed this piece, Blue Eyes Indonesian Legend, that he made while he was overseas in Indonesia. 
Um, he also had work in the landmark Two Century sh Show, Two Centuries of Black American Art in 1976, uh, curated by um, the, our recently departed David Driscoll. Um, and you're seeing images of Roden's work in the show in the image in the middle at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and on the right in the Dallas Museum of Fine Art, um, which is also, you know, I think it's lovely to see this large Roden bronze work in the foreground and in the background, these really beautiful works by Alma Thomas and this uh, sort of youth group in the middle um, being toured through the work. Um, but the first commission, large-scale commission that Roden ever did was for the Sheraton Hotel in Philadelphia in 1956. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a piece he did this uh, indoor wall for the hotel ballroom's main stairway. And so what's sort of interesting about it is that you can see uh, this is Roden with the, with the wall sculpture after he's finished it. So this is 1956. This is Philadelphia. Um, this would have been his first large-scale commission. And uh, I wish I was sort of projecting this in space on a larger screen so you could see the ornate details that you can see that there's a way that he incorporates all of these smaller uh, details that he used in his in his smaller bronze works into this large, larger than life piece for this hotel. Um, and it actually looks quite a bit like some of the some of the work that he was doing in his own home. Um, and I'll show an image of the interior of the Roden home. So in their four-story house in Brooklyn Heights, um, you can see some of the sculptures, some, some sculptures by Roden in the foreground, but there are a number of large-scale screens that he produced that, you know, there were articles written about that were about the neighborhood walking tour. Um, the fact that they had moved into this space that was really kind of bare and they had to impose a lot of interior home elements themselves, but that it was really artful. So here's a screen that you're seeing that um, was, it, it functioned as a kind of decorative object almost, a room divider in the home. Um, you can see that there are a number of them throughout the home, that this is a feature of John and Rashonda's home life. And so it's kind of interesting to see that in this early moment in Roden's career, it's also a feature of his public life, his commission life, that, that he gets commissioned to do this kind of work for the Sheraton Hotel. Um, and I hope you're being able to see some visual continuity between the kind of geometric elements, these almost like hieroglyphic uh, features of the various metal panels on this wall in the Sheraton Hotel, which unfortunately is no longer with us. I think it was uh, lost in, in an earlier remodel of the Sheraton Hotel in Philadelphia. Um, he also sculpted this piece, The Family, for Harlem Hospital in New York. And this is the sculpture that adorns the building. It still adorns the building of the hospital today. <laughs> Um, and it's mentioned in the article, and you can see a kind of approach to the figure. Um, if we're thinking about, you know, at this point, this would have been 1966, where Roden was interested in abstract figuration, um, but also Harlem Hospital was new at the time, and so this sort of this commission for a public building, it's really lovely to think about what it might have looked like at the time that he was thinking about who, what was happening in the neighborhood in Harlem, who that hospital would have serving that he sculpted this he sculpts this piece for it that's a, a figure of um, a nuclear family, two adults and their two children being cradled by these human hands that come out from the building. Like this idea that the sculpture for Roden is he's thinking about the figure, but he's also thinking about the public use and the audience for this. So that this really becomes a kind of monument to care. That he's thinking about this is a building um, that is needing to serve its community in a caring capacity, um, which I think is, is, is sort of poignant for the, for the moment that we're in. Um, I'm thinking about the value of healthcare workers and, and how all of the conversations we're having in our field right now about the blend of art and science and how they come together and when they come together and what, what that utility is for. Um, he also did another piece for uh, a different hospital in New York. This is for Bellevue and this piece is called Mitochondria. And this is a more abstract piece than the previous one. Um, I'm showing you an archival image on the left for scale. Uh, and so this comes out of Roden's interest in sort of scientific research, and it's really his creative artistic take on 
um, you know, the science research. And so for this abstract piece, he was thinking about energy, the energy of the cell. Another piece that he had pitched for the same commission for the hospital um, drew on like the idea of DNA and the imagery of the double helix. And so it's really interesting. Um, I actually prefer this piece to the to the other draft that that he ended up not producing for the hospital. Um, because it, it's, it's open for interpretation in a different way. And again, you can see this kind of ambitious work in bronze. This is really a massive, beautiful abstract piece. Um, and for Philadelphians, uh, you may recognize this piece, Nasaika, uh, which was commissioned for the African American Museum in Philadelphia in 1976, associated with the museum's founding and grand opening. Um, and so for Philadelphians, this is on view at 7th and Arch. And this is inspired by his world travels. It's a kind of syncretic blend, I think, of his approach to the figure. You can see that it's both, it's a bit figurative, it's a bit abstract. Um, it is, um, I'm gonna quote here from his statement on the piece, that the forms of Nisaika very much represent her name, a people. The thrust of the central figure shows determination and energy that the people expend to make their realization. Um, he's thinking here about uh, the sort of, the ethnic blend of, of Black Americans. And so Nasaika is drawn out of like this idea of out of the many people one. Um, it's, it comes from a, from a Chinook jargon uh, that is associated with um, in sort of indigenous Alaskan. And so he's thinking about indigeneity, um, African uh, heritage and sculptural tradition. Uh, this is after he would have traveled throughout North Africa and West Africa and been trained in, in other kinds of sculptural production. And so he's thinking about the Black, the Indigenous, uh, in America in the construction of this piece. Um, and so the archival photos you're looking at here, also just to give you another vantage view on the left, um, this is Roden working with Nasaika at Modern Art Foundry, um, which is a foundry in New York that Roden worked with his entire life. It's still there. Um, I have visited and they have been lucky, luck, very lovely uh, in sharing their research and notes. And so I do want to thank them publicly for that. Um, and on the right, this is Roden pictured with Terry Doak at the, uh, at the time, the Afro-American Historical and Cultural Museum um, outside at the unveiling uh, in the early days of the African-American Museum of this uh, public piece. Uh, and so in the late 1980s, Roden also was commissioned to do a statue uh, for Lincoln University, and this is a Frederick Douglass. Um, and so you're on the right, you're looking at a, a maquette of the Frederick Douglass piece that's in uh, Pathis collection. And part of what I want to zero in on here is the kind of details of this figure. And so you can see that this is, you know, this is Frederick Douglass, the most depicted figure of the 19th century. Um, and he's a writer, an abolitionist, a uh, really important figure in Black history. And so Roden's take on him is really interesting that you see him standing legs apart as if he's moving. Um, and on the right, he's holding a, a kind of scroll, um, this, this representation of like the written word or written material in education. Um, and in his left hand, I'm hoping that you can see that he's holding a, a chain where the links, the, the last link has been broken. Um, and this is a kind of intention use of um, sort of monumentality. Roden's really trading here in the visual language of the public monument, the statue, the how you approach the figure in a public commission, which is very different than the way he sculpted figures in his private work. Um, and on the left, I have a page from uh, Jet Magazine in 19... 90, I believe, um, and they covered this unveiling of the Frederick Douglass statue at Lincoln University uh, in Chester County here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I believe this is uh, I'm sorry, this is November 1989 issue of Jet Magazine um, that describes the statue as standing uh, 10 feet, six inches tall and weighing 1200 pounds. Um, and so thinking about just the the massive 
just the gravity, like to give the figure of Frederick Douglass this kind of gravity, this monumentality, because he deserves a kind of gravitas, is something that a number of artists have done really intentionally. But it's important in the 20th century, and if you think about our current conversations around monuments, um, who deserves to be a monument, who deserves to be depicted monumentally, um, this is a really intentional use of making sure that these figures who are important to Black history and deserve a kind of gravitas get that in the materiality of how he's producing them um, as part of this public commission work, thinking about, you know, if this is a commission for um, an HBCU, again, it's clear that he's thinking about who the audience for this work is um, and being really intentional and attuned to what that audience might want to see in the same way that I think he gives a kind of care to the commission that he did for the African American Museum in Philadelphia. And there's a similar kind of care that extends to, uh, this is a commission he did for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, um, a piece for their unveiling, and this is Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Um, and so for our listeners who might not know, uh, so Fred Shuttlesworth is a Birmingham born and based minister and civil rights activist um, who, is the, the founding sort of figure associated with the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, um, in part because of the location of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. So it's in Kelly Ingram Park, which is itself kind of a, a complicated and contested site in Birmingham. And so again, you see Roden extending a kind of, you know, a care for the figure, for the audience to know that Kelly Ingram Park was an important civil rights site, a site of struggle. Um, historically in Birmingham in a way that is very different than a kind of commission, the, com the, the commissions for Lincoln University or for the hospitals where those sites have a different kind of history. Um, here, Kelly Ingram Park sort of serves this, this as a different kind of space. And so knowing that visitors to the Birmingham Rights Civil Institute will be attuned to that history, that they'll have a particular kind of relationship to Shuttlesworth, that Shuttlesworth also gets depicted in this way as this kind of elder statesman almost. Again, this, this standing figure who seems to be moving. Um, he's very stately. He gets depicted in this way that you typically see war heroes depicted. And a number of art historians and architectural historians have written about this um, in a way that I think is really interesting. Um, I'm going to quote from Del Upton's What Can and Can't Be Said, Race, Uplift, and Monument Building in the Contemporary South, um, that he analyzes this particular moment in history where all of these monuments to the civil rights movement um, are starting to be erected in the southern United States at this time. Um, and he notes that these standing figures or busts fit squarely into an international 19th century tradition created to honor the heroes of bourgeois republics. They single out otherwise ordinary men as models of achievement in democratic societies. Um, and so thinking about what it's possible to say with these monuments, um, Upton is really pointing to the history of the genre of the monument um, and sort of thinking about, you know, what, what it means to depict a monument um, as a figure on a horse, like the concept of a war hero, what it means to construct a monument um, where you have a figure standing, um, you know, larger than life, like very upright, very intentionally sort of chin up um, that he towers over the viewers. Um, I think this is a conversation that extends to today to how we talk about monuments. If we're thinking about contemporary works and dealing with the symbolism of, uh, of like a Hank Willis Thomas's All Power to All People, um, the Afro Picfist that was uh, at Dilworth Plaza in Philadelphia and is now in Pappas Permanent Collection, or how we talk about Kahindi Wiley's um, uh, figure uh, the recent work that he did for the Victoria, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, the the figure on the horse, the rising, like the idea of you know we know what a monument is because of how the figure is depicted and who we expect to see um, as worthy of this kind of monumental public sculpture. But that artists have been reckoning with that in their in their practice in a really technical and material way. I think is something that has a long history and you see it in Roden's work and it's really interesting. Um, and I sort of wanted to highlight that today as a way to open up a conversation about monumentality and and the figure. Um, 
and this kind of under-recognized sculptor who actually has a lot of public work that maybe people don't know John Roden's name, but a lot of people have seen a lot of public work by John Roden. Um, and when you look at that work, you can tell that Roden was thinking about the very different publics that might have interacted with this work. There's a sort of through line uh, between his, his training, his world travels, um, his military history, this, this kind of early career um, sculpting uh, figures in the military, doing these portrait busts, and this later career, these commissions to then do these monuments that are tributes to these figures that are important for um, both the audience and for the moment that they emerged in and the historical moment of trying to commemorate them. Um, it's just kind of a really nice way to think about what the through line for that is. Um, and I do want to thank, you know, this is a team sport, uh, a number of institutions that have supported this work in various ways. Um, it is impossible to do the kind of work that we do in museums without other institutions. Um, and so I want to name specifically a lot of institutions that were cited here. Um, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the American Academy of Rome, the Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland. Um, condolences to you this week, uh, Howard University Art Gallery, the John Roden Papers at PAFA, LACMA, the NEH, the Rockefeller Archives Center, and the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. Uh, you all have been really, really crucial to how we think and talk about this work, and also really generous with your archives. So many of these images uh, came from your archives, so it's also nice to think about the institutional breadth of um, Roden's life and career, that these are all institutions that he touched in his life and in his work enough that they have been crucial to providing the, the intellectual background for the kinds of thinking we can do about his collection at PAFA now. And I'm being um, mindful of time. I'm noting that it's 1240. Um, so do we have any questions? Abby, can I, can I throw this back to? Hi. Yeah, so I do notice that we've had a hand raised since the start of the program from Chris. Um, so Chris, if that's all right with you, we'll start. And for anybody just to go over it, if you, in case you weren't here, if you'd like to ask us questions um, written or you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in a question and we'll be able to see it there. Or you can go over to the participant button click on that and then you should see an option to raise your hand and we can call on you and unmute you and hear from you verbally. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, but let me see. Oh, I think Chris actually just dropped his hand. So we'll wait on that one. But we do have a question in the chat function, which is also something we can do. So this is what do we know about his prep to make this sculpture, these sculptures? And did he take notes or draw it on paper? A bit of a process question. Yeah, um, I love a process question. So thank you for that. Um, he did take a lot of notes and did do a lot of sketches. Um, in in the archives, which we're currently in the still in the in the throes of processing, we are finding that he did a lot of sketches for um, his sculptures before they were, before he finished them. He worked with the same foundry when he worked in bronze for his entire career. Um, and so they have notes, they have his notes. Um, you can tell that he was meeting with them with fabricators often. Uh, mm -hmm. When I spoke to uh, the staff there, um, it's run by somebody who took it over from his father. And he was talking about, you know, what it meant to to see Roden all of the time, just really hands on working with the foundry, going through various iterations of his work as he made them, um, or as he would he would do one version of it and change things in between versions, uh, particularly in bronze. I think there's. I think because of the kinds of production that large scale bronze work requires, um, it's much easier in that medium to see his process because it requires so much sketching and so much note taking and so much communication with fabricators and the foundries. Um, and that especially with commissions, that that work requires uh, a lot of preliminary pitches to both institutions or in the case of private collectors, like a really an iterative process where he goes back and forth uh, between, you know, if it's a hospital or if it's a museum, various kinds of drawings um, and expectations for what that final product will look like. 
Thanks, Brittany. We also, um, as you can tell, I'm getting used to this format. We, I missed part of that question too, because I didn't scroll down. They also wanted to ask if we have any archival video footage of him explaining his process. We do not. Um, I'm hoping that there are other institutions that do. Um, I know that there's some video interf in some video interview footage um, at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art where he talks a little bit about his life and his practice. Um, and I think the Smithsonian Archives of American Art um, has some definitely audio, possibly video of Roden talking about his work. Um, but he, he passed away in 2001. And as far as I know, we don't have process video, which does not mean that it does not exist. Um, so if, if anybody out there is listening to this and knows someone or, or has a hunch that someone somewhere might have some footage, please let us know. I like it, make it happen. All right, so we have a question in the Q&A portion of the forum. Do you have a target date for the PAFA exhibition? And will there be a published book in conjunction with the show? And are there any, any other books out there right now on his works? Yes. Um, so yes, we do have a target date. Um, this exhibition is currently slated to open in 2022. Um, there is going to be an exhibition catalog along with this. And there aren't any existing books on John Roden, which is a part of the challenge of working on this exhibition and catalog is that it requires so much original research. Um, there are some there's some writing on Rodin and other exhibition catalogs. So in the catalog for the Two Centuries of Black American Art Show, um, there is a section on Rodin because he had work in the exhibition. Um, and so there's a really lovely spotlight on him and his practice. Um, but most of what's written in the exhibition catalog for the show at PAFA will be based on the original research that we're doing right now. Um, and to be able to do that kind of research and writing, it'll be a multi-author publication. Mm -hmm. um, but to do that research, uh, it requires scholars to rely on the John Roden papers. And so this is, you're really getting a kind of behind the scenes look at um, research that's still in progress. We're processing the papers, we're analyzing the papers and talking to other scholars, um, other art historians, other artists in our communities. Um, and that's what's producing this conversation. Um, perfect. So we have another question. I think it's just immediately riffing on that. So if I want to see his work, I can either go to PAFA, the African American Museum of Philadelphia and the Sheraton. Any other Philly sites? Um, so unfortunately, you actually can't see that Sheraton work. I think, I think the Sheraton had a remodel um, before even I had a chance to see it a few years ago. And so that um, gorgeous wall sculpture now is externally existing archives. Um, but the, the other public sculpture in, in the area would be that Frederick Douglass uh, commission for Lincoln University, mm. which I believe is in, it, just outside Philadelphia proper. Mm. Nice. It's a good time to get out of the city. <laughs> it is. Um, oh, they asked if the Sheraton work was destroyed. I, I don't know for sure, um, but I, I'm, I don't think that it was saved. Which is, which is a real shame because it's, it's really beautiful in photos. Mm -hmm. We have another open question from Jane. Can you talk a little bit about the PAFA papers and can you, can you describe their scope and content even pre preliminarily? Yeah. Um, so the John Roden papers at PAFA are primarily um, photos, uh, letters, uh, correspondence between Roden and mostly professional correspondence between uh, Roden, his associates, his friends, um, commissions, clients, etc. cetera. Um, and a lot of travel photography and slides. Um, and so the collection of sculpture is really really, I mean, the John Roden papers really complement the sculpture collection by allowing us to contextualize all that work. Um, and so I can, um, I can send somebody sort of like a preliminary overview after this conversation if they're interested. Um, but it's primarily uh, documents related to his education and world travels. Um, a few letters between uh, John and Rashonda or John and friends while he was abroad, a lot of papers related to his sculpture commissions um, and files related to exhibitions that he participated in um, and a lot 
and I mean, thousands of travel photos that are really quite impressive. If you think about, um, you know, just an archive of mid-century uh, Europe, South Asia, North and West Africa, um, and New York from an artist's perspective. It's a lot of really incredible photos. I mean, it seems like he, he and Rashonda had a really beautiful cosmopolitan life. That sounds like another art at noon to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we're in the process of digitizing now the archives um, under, under our director, Wang Tran. Um, and I think we, the, our end goal is to publish, to make publish publicly available um, around 5,000 uh, digitized files from that archive. Um, so that's still in the works. Right. Um, do we have any other questions? We just have a couple minutes left. Uh, or someone who wants to raise their hand. Uh, we have some wonderful feedback. Oh, uh, I see a question about the Frederick Douglass statue. Yes, that's still on view at Lincoln. Oh, yes. Perfect. Oh, someone asked, um, how did Papa acquire the papers? Um, and if you have any information on his wife's work, and she was also an artist. Yeah, um, so the papers and the archive of sculptures uh, came to Papa before I did. Um, so that's something that uh, Papha and the executor of the Roden Estate, after both John and Rashonda passed, worked that out. Mm -hmm. um, the, our understanding is that the Rodens wanted that archive that they lived with. I mean, if, if people think about 300 sculptures, um, if we go back to that photo of the Roden works in their home, they really lived with all of that artwork. Um, and so the hope was that um, all of the sculptures would end up in a museum collection and an archive that would be in a position to do the kind of um, exhibition that we're working on right now. Um, and so the Roden estate executor worked out um, the relationship that that meant that all of the sculptures came to Papa um, and you know with a, with a number of other elements of the kind of stewardship around John Roden's legacy which includes the John and Rashonda Roden Art Center, um, the physical auditorium at Papa now which is like a really lovely building um, which for folks in Philadelphia there are some sculptures by Roden that are installed in that auditorium so you can see a suite of works by John in bronze metal and stone on view now um, but the the papers also came to Papa because Papa has an archivist and an archive center um, that that research is really crucial to being able to do an exhibition and catalog on the work because there is not a lot of secondary source material written on John Roden. There's not, um, there's not an artist monograph or a really in-depth take. There's quite a bit of journalism, but no one has compiled all of that writing or all of the exhibition reviews into a single document. So this book is really going to be um, the first sort of major offering on Roden, um, hopefully the first of many. Um, and um, for the question about his wife's work, I know she was a painter um, and it seems like the Rodens didn't maintain an archive of her paintings in the same way. Um, but I do know that there are a number of people who are interested in, in her work. Um, she painted throughout her life and there was a small show, a, a small gallery show in Brooklyn, I believe around the time I started at PAFA, um, that was a show of her work. And so I'm still in conversation with the curator who put on that show at Soloway Gallery, um, which was really sort of like a lovely show. And, and there's, we, we sort of think and talk about, or at, the, at that exhibition, we talked about this as a kind of, you know, it would be nice if multiple people took multiple parts of the Roden stories. Um, just really the idea that it would be lovely to see their story fleshed out in this field, like across institutions and scholars. Nice. Um, well, I do see we have our first hand raise. So Chris, I'm gonna allow you to talk and we'll hear you your question live. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, I have a question about his wood carving in Indonesia. Did he have a special teacher um, in wood carving other than his, his, his college um, instruction? Not that I know of. I know that he 
went to Indonesia to do some work with the Bandung Institute of Technology. Um, and my understanding from the, from the archival records, from notes and letters, um, is that that was mostly about instruction and student advising um, and helping to sort of set up and consolidate a sculpture department at the uh, Institute of Technology in Bandung. Um, but I think that the some of his earliest work in wood in our collection are very, very early in his career. They're from like the 1940s, 1950s. Um, and so I do think that his primary teachers for that were the faculty at Columbia uh, and Richmond Marte. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right. Well, I think if we don't, do we have one more? No, I think. Sorry, just making sure we didn't miss anybody. Um, we have one more message down here. Um, some of his sculptures, um, did he work with a team to create some of the pieces? So some sculptors work with a team to create their pieces, did Rodin? Um, I, I think we can think about his collaboration, the, the relationship he had with the staff at the Modern Art Foundry in that way. Um, I don't think that you know, if we're thinking about the sculptors now who have a kind of um, like a formal studio and use a studio system um, or have a team of studio assistants, there hasn't been, there's, there's nothing in the archive that suggests that Rodin had that kind of relationship that sort of, um, that almost, I almost think of like, uh, not quite the factory system, but I know that there are a number of artists that run their studios with a handful of staff members um, and they do work in collaboration to fabricate, to design and fabricate the, the work. Um, it doesn't seem like Roden made work that way. There are a lot of sketches and drawings um, that make it seem like he was really dreaming up this work himself. Um, and doing a lot of experimentation to make sure he could carry it out. And not every piece was sort of pulled off. There are a number of things in the collection at PAFA, a number of sculptural pieces that seem like they're elements of a piece or attempts at making a piece. Um, or you, if, you, if you look at the sketches and you look at the pieces, it seems like it, the piece didn't maybe come out quite the way he imagined that it would. Um, and so he's refashioning pieces, um, but it doesn't seem like he worked with a team to make the work. It, it seems like it was primarily him. Great. Well, just cognizant of the time, um, I wanted to thank all of you for coming. And of course, thank Dr. Brittany Webb for sharing your lovely scholarship. It's been so nice to have, have you with us today. Um, thanks for everyone for your questions and your comments and for being here. It's so lovely to have this community virtually with all of you each week. Um, I do want to do a quick plug. Please join us for future programs. We have another Art at Noon next week. Um, it's going to be focusing on Jewish art since we have a couple of days left in that holiday and are in the Jewish holiday. Um, and you can check out our website for more listings. We have two more this week, Papa Pours tomorrow with Dr. Anna Marley, and we have a Coffee and Culture with Book. Brooke Anderson. So again, thank you to all for joining us. And thank you, Brittany. This was lovely. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Yeah. All right. Take care. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. <laughs>